So in the last lecture you have shown a graph no sir AKT versus omega. Yes. There as time period increases won't the graph change? Yeah, graph uh, lines will uh, become closer. So in the graph also so like won't it the amplitude increase? No, a, if you see a k t, it was a constant thing, right? It was not a function of t. So, but it was a function of omega, right? No, it was a function of omega not, not omega. So, sir, and omega not is two pi by t, right? Yeah. So, as t increases, then it depends. Yeah. On so the so AKT will not change. That means its y-axis will not change. AKT was on the y-axis, right? So what would happen is uh, simply the lines will become closure because of uh, T increasing. So let me show the graph again, if you wish. Let me pull up that slide. So if you can look at the slide, can you uh, see my slide now? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at this, uh, this one. So here we have this AKT. This is simply, this 2T1, right? So this is constant. And then you have this thing, which is not a function of, T, right? This is just a function of omega, which is actually k omega naught in this case. So basically, this is a sink. This quantity is sink omega t1. So this thing will not change. This thing will remain at the same place, right? If I look at the envelope envelope will also not change because this is simply sync omega t1 so this will have a sync envelope this is not going to change what would change is the lines because omega corresponds to omega k omega naught right so these lines will become closer as t increases okay Yes. OK. So now let us come to today's lecture. Any other question from this last lecture? All right. So now let us come to today's lecture. And let us now start this lecture by deriving few Fourier transforms. And the first Fourier transform that we would derive is of ut, unit step function. So everyone just get started and try to find out what is the Fourier transform of unit step function. You already know the formula for a transform, right? So to find for a transform, we simply have to take ut and we multiply this with e to the power minus j omega t and we integrate everything 
from minus infinity to plus infinity. And the running variable is of course T because Fourier transform has to be function of omega. Right, so you have to evaluate this. Now because this is ut, this is simply 0 to infinity e to the power minus j omega t dt, right? And no problem, so I can write this something like this. This is the integration of e to the power minus j omega t, right? So infinity to 0. Now I will run into trouble, right? Because I do not know what is e to the power minus j omega t at infinity. And at this point, this integration will become unsolvable. OK. So definitely this is not the way to proceed for the Fourier transform of unit step function. So we might have to play some tricks. So how should we calculate the Fourier transform of UT? It's a, it's a big important question. In your textbook, it is not discussed. It's, it's a skipped because I think it's little complicated. So it is important that you focus your attention to this question now. I've already explained that just trying to solve the integration will not work. It is unsolvable. So let us try to do something else. And what I try to do is, let us say the Fourier transform of ut is u omega. And the way I want to think about ut is like this. I would like to take limit a tends to 0, e to the power minus a t ut. If I take this function and if I keep the limit of a tending to 0, then this function will become ut. Okay. And I already know the Fourier transform of this function. We have solved this in the last class. So this gives us some hope of calculating the Fourier transform of ut. So actually I am trying to calculate the Fourier transform of this function. And again using Fibonacci's theorems, these limits and Fourier transforms are interchangeable because Fourier transform is just integration, right? So you can always change the order of limits and integration and summation whatsoever. You have full freedom in this course to do all of these things. So this is simply limit of Fourier transform of this function. And I already have calculated what is Fourier transform of this function in the last lecture, and this is simply 1 upon a plus j omega. So Fourier transform of ut is limit a tends to 0, 1 upon a plus j omega. So if omega is not zero, then I can easily solve this limit. This is simply one upon j omega, if omega is not zero. But when omega is zero, then there is some ambiguity. Okay, and let us see how to solve this limit as well. So I hope this is clear. When omega is not zero, then this limit is simply one upon j omega. When omega is zero, I am slightly in trouble and I do not know for sure what this limit is going to be. And thus I have to do something else. Okay. So what I do to solve this limit is as following. So I multiply both numerator and denominator by a minus j omega. You know, complex numbers, you always do this trick, right? So instead of calculating this limit, I calculate this limit, multiply everything with a minus j omega. 
and limits are also linear, right? So you must have studied this. So limit of this function is simply limit of this function minus limit of this function. Okay. Fine, so let us first look at what is the limit of this function. And then probably we will look at limit of this function. So we have to calculate two limits. You can stop me anytime, ask questions, no problem. The onus is on you to stop me. Now if I look at this function, without limits, just look at this. What is this? This is some uh, some function like this. Forget about this mod. OK, so I'm just plotting this function. That does not have it here. So when omega is zero. This is simply one by a. And as omega increases. As omega increases, you know that this is going to decrease. You can also work out the maths yourself and you can convince yourself that this will be some function like this. If I want to calculate the area of this function, area of this a upon a square plus omega square, let's say from minus infinity to plus infinity with respect to d omega. And you immediately know what is this area. Right? Everyone knows what the area is because this is this is a function that we see quite common in maths. Right? So everyone knows what the area of this function is. Area is simply pi. And this area interestingly does not depend upon a. That's something nice. So again, I repeat this, whatever this function is, the area of this function is constant pi. It is not a function of A. So whatever might be your A, this area is going to be intact. Now let us do one thought experiment and let us say my A decreases. What would happen? So if a decreases, one by a will increase. So I will have this function starting from this point somewhere top. And this will begin to shrink. Because its area is constant. So if its height is increasing, this is going to shrink. If a further increases, what would happen? This will again go. It will have higher amplitude and this will again go to shrink. Okay. So as A reduces, what would happen? Let's say now, what is the limit A tends to zero? What would be this function? Everyone should tell me instantaneously, what is this? Delta omega. Delta. One by pi into delta. No, pi delta omega. Pi delta. Yeah, correct. This is an impulse function, right? Because it has a nice property that its area remains constant. And as A shrinks down to zero, this really becomes an impulse. And because the area of this function is pi, I have to multiply this pi by delta omega. So this is OK. So I have solved the first limit. The first limit is done. We have got this nice pi delta omega, which is what we wanted. Now let us look at the second limit. The second limit is also trivial. This is easier, right? When omega is zero, two cases. When omega is zero, what is the answer? So you have zero 
in the numerator when omega is zero. And you have a square, right? OK, limit a tends to zero. Now what is the answer for this limit? This is zero. There's no ambiguity because the numerator is zero where your denominator approaches zero. So when we solve this kind of things, we know the answer has to be zero. So when omega is zero, this limit is zero. When omega is not zero, let us see what happens. When omega is not zero, this is simply j omega. Because a tends to zero, I can write this as j omega by omega square. So this is j by omega. When omega is not zero, this is j, uh, j by omega. So actually I was looking to find out the limit of this function, which is this and this. So my answer is when omega is zero, it has to be pi delta omega. Right? Because this plus this is pi delta omega. And when omega is not zero, this, this does not have any contribution when omega is not zero. So the answer is simply one upon j omega. Right? Because of this minus, my j comes in the denominator. OK. Any question? Now in your textbook, the answer is given as this. Instead of this. And you can see that these two answers dif differ only at a countable point. Right. So the, there is no difference in the answers. Right? There's a continuous fun time, uh, continuous function, which differs only at a single point. So instead of writing this like this, you can also conveniently write it like this. No, no problem. Okay. So the Fourier transform of ut is simply this thing: one up, uh, one by g omega plus pi delta omega. Any question? Can I proceed ahead? Say big yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. OK. Yes, sir. Now let us try to find a simple problem. So today we will do a lot of Fourier transforms of different signals. So what is the Fourier transform of this function? Rect t by t. And in the course, I always assume the same definition of rectangular function. Everyone must know it. Sometimes even in question papers, I will skip this definition because it's so common. So you have to know this. So what is this rec t by t? The definition is always that this function is going to be one, this thing, when t or mod t okay is less than or equals to does not matter same thing is less than t by 2 and this is zero elsewhere so this is the definition of rec t by t that we will assume in the course okay Now, what is the Fourier transform of this? It's easy. We can just solve this using integration. So x omega is simply e to the power minus j omega t dt. And we have to choose the limits as minus t by 2 to plus t by 2. And every one of you can solve it. So I'm not repeating all the steps. You can look through all these steps, I think. Solving this integration is quite easy. The final answer for this transform is this function. And we got a similar answer in Fourier series also. 
So you have to remember the answer that this is T. Sink omega T by 2. OK. So there is nothing like plotting this. We already have seen that the Fourier transform of this function is this. So let us now plot this. So at omega zero, my amplitude spectral density is capital T. And when does this sync function become zero? When omega T by two is M pi. So from here, this becomes zero when omega is two M pi by T. So the first null point is at two by T. Right, the second null point will be at. What? Four pi by T and so on and so forth. This null point is at minus two pi by T. So you have to remember this even in sleep that if you take a rectangular pulse. Of duration capital T. Then the first null point. Will happen at one by T. If you are looking at F. And the first null point will happen at 2 pi by t if you're looking at omega. This is important thing and you have to remember it, sort of remember it because you will not have the time to always derive this from the first principles. You derive it once and then you remember also the key results. And it's also very easy. If the width is t, the first null point is at 1 by t. Okay. So this is an important function. I repeat the Fourier transform of a rectangular function is a sink function. And there is also a relationship between the null points of a sink and the width of rectangular function. All right. Now let us try to think about how do we find the area of this function? Area of this t sync omega t by 2. How do we find the area? Now if you if you think about this, finding area seems easy, but it isn't. If you directly try to find out area of this function, this is what you have to do, right? And you will soon see that however smart you are in maths, you will run into deep troubles if you want to solve this integration. So it's sync, right? Yeah, it's sync, sync. I missed the C. Yeah, sorry. I hope it was correct here. Yeah. So however smart you are, you you would see that you will run into troubles if you want to solve this integration. It's very difficult integration to solve. So how do we do this? And of course we have to use Fourier transforms to solve this integration, which I will present in a while. But even before Fourier transforms, transforms were known to mathematicians, there was a trick that people could use to solve this complicated integration. Trick or hack or whatever. So the trick that people could use to solve this integration is as following. And you can see for yourself that this is true. If let us assume that you have a sync function. Okay. You try to create a rect uh, triangle. Which. With one edge of the triangle joining the peak. And the two edges joining the null point, so we can create a triangle like I have created. And the area of the sink sink function. Is simply the area of the triangle. 
Hard to believe this, but this is true. So what is the area of the triangle? Let us see. Half base into height. So this is half. What is base? Base will be 4 pi by t. Height is t. So we get the answer as 2 pi. It's very unbelievable thing, but it, it's correct, right? So people could use this hack and can try to compute the area of a sine function. Okay. Now, because we know Fourier transforms, we can also get the answer, the correct answer, by using Fourier transforms. Okay. So let us see how can we use Fourier transforms to compute the area of this function. But this is also an important idea which we will keep using in this course because yeah, using Fourier transforms is sometimes inconvenient. And so this hack, this always works. OK, so you have to remember this hack. So the other parts, the area under the other parts? We'll Which find no, so the total area of this thing function, the total area, this area, this area, this area, whatever, this area, the total area of the sink function can be given exactly without any errors by just the area of this triangle which you create. Okay. So Probably I have not drawn this figure correctly, but this is correct. This is exact. So this area, whatever this area is of the triangle, this includes this area, this area, this area, all areas. Okay, so you do not have to uh, draw different triangles. You just have one triangle. And this area of this triangle gives out the total area of the same function. OK. Yes. Okay. So now let us see if this answer 2 pi is correct. How do we solve this? We can use what is known as moments theorem. And moments theorem are this easiest theorem that you would ever see. So moments theorem simply use. Synthesis equation and analysis equation. Two equations that we know already. So it says that if you put in this equation, t equals to zero. Okay. You already know this equation. Just put t equals to zero. What will we get? We will get 2 pi x zero is this thing. That means the area of the transformed signal is simply 2 pi x zero. It's easy. So if you see that rect t by t gives out the transformed as t sync omega t by 2. So the area of this part is simply what? This is simply 2 pi rect 0. Rect 0 is 1, so this area is simply 2 pi. Wow, easy. No problems. And this is same as the area of that triangle that we have drawn. So this hack works. Don't ask me for a proof of the hack, but it works. And you have to use the hack until and unless you prove that this hack may not work for a certain cases. But in my opinion, this works always. And now let us look at this part also. So in the analysis equation, if I put omega as zero, so we get x of zero. This is the in total area of the time domain signal. That means if you have to find out the area of rect t by t, though this is very simple to calculate, this area is simply what? T sync zero. OK, so this is T and you can verify that this area is T, right? Rectangular area is T. 
because it has got a width of t and its amplitude is one. So this area is capital T and you can use also the moments theorem to derive this. So Fourier transforms are useful at least to calculate areas of few functions whose area is otherwise very difficult to compute. Okay. Any doubt? No. That's okay. I have already explained this. So now let us use this hack and try to see a few things. Suppose you are given that you have a rectangular function and even in sleep, you can remember that it's for a transform is sync function, right? So you know that is for a transform is sync. But suppose you forget what is the amplitude of the sync and where are the null points? Suppose we don't remember this, but you know for sure that this is going to be some sync function. Can we use the moments theorem and the hack? to calculate these two quantities. Of course. So you just have to look at the area of this rectangular function. Area is T. So its amplitude has to be T. Right. This is easy. Now you know that. Its amplitude of the rectangular function is one. So you know if you can create a triangle. The area of this triangle has to be 2 pi. Right, because this is 2 pi x 0. So area of the sink function should be 2 pi x 0. And the area of sink function is nothing but the area of the triangle. So the area of the triangle should be 2 pi x 0. x 0 is 1. So you know that the area of triangle has to be 2 pi. And you know that the half into base into height. Height is T. Is 2 pi. So you know base has to be 4 pi by T. So base has to be 4 pi by T and sync is a symmetric function. So you know that this point has to be 2 pi by T and this point has to be minus 2 pi by T. OK. When you will. Uh, become of my age. You will not remember what's the Fourier transform of rect T by T. It's very hard to remember. So I always use the combination of this hack. And the moments theorem to derive. Yeah, what should be the amplitude of the sink and where should be the first null points? OK. If you know these things, then you can always write the mathematical function for the sink. Any doubt? OK, solve this. Let me see how many of you have absorbed this. So I have now a sink function. In the time domain. And the null points are at pi and minus pi. Height is 4 and I have a rectangular function as Fourier transform. Let us believe that this is correct. So I have not proven that the Fourier transform of a uh, sink function is a rectangular function. But this will be true in general. Let me give you a theorem which I will prove whenever the right times comes in. This theorem is known as duality theorem. Duality theorem says that if the Fourier transform of table. Table, you know, right? If the Fourier transform of table is chair, the Fourier transform of chair will be table. In simple terms. This is what the duality theorem is. And using duality, if you know that Fourier transform of rectangular function is sync. Fourier transform of sync will be rectangle. OK, so some insights in duality theorem, I can simply say this. 
if you do not want to believe duality theorem, it's okay. You can assume that this is the Fourier transform and you have to compute the right values of A and W. Go ahead and tell me what is the correct answer. I don't know what the correct answer is, so let me work this out. Okay. So, yeah, what is the area of this sink function? Area is half base, base is 2 pi into height is 4. So, this is what? This is 4 pi, right? So, the area of this thing will be its height okay so this a is 4 pi that's that's correct so yeah this and this option can be deleted now the second part is excuse me sir yes here uh, isn't 2 pi x is 0 is area of uh, this Fourier transform right so a shouldn't a be 2 2 pi times a should be right no, so the area of a transformed signal is 2 pi x0. So x omega. Okay, you are taking the other Fine. This is 2 pi x0. Okay. So anyway, so I have to use this. So a times w is 2 pi x0. What is x0? 4. So we know a times w is. 8 pi and w a i have calculated as 4 pi so w has to be 2 okay so this option seems correct i'm um, so a times 2w because minus w to w so 2 a w yes 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 uh, yeah, yeah 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 correct yeah so yes so uh no but a times yeah, yeah this a times 2 w has to be 8 pi correct so this w has to be 1 right yeah sorry okay so now let us see we know enough now about this rectangular and sink function and they help me in calculating few other transforms so now let us look at this again. So we know that rectangular function has a sink transform. That's OK. Now let me do one thought experiment. Increase this T, capital T. And what should happen? Yeah. So could you go to the previous slide once? Yes. Yeah. Here, uh, if I take it opposite, like here you took this rectangular function as the x omega, right? Can you mm -hmm. take it the other way? Is it possible? Like I take this as the my function and the other one sync as my Fourier transform. Yeah, so th this is what we have done before, okay. right? So this here. So I'm getting different answer in that case, actually. Yeah, you will get a different answer, right? Because. But A should be exactly same, right? Because. Like considering duality theorem is valid. A no, should no, be no, same. No, 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 no. So duality theorem. So yeah, duality theorem says that the Fourier transform of table is chair and Fourier transform of chair is table. But the constants, there might be some constants here and there, which we are ignoring. I just stated it very simply, right? But there are some constants that would appear uh, in these equations. Okay. 
So let us say Fourier transform of table is chair, the Fourier transform of K times chair, where K is some constant is table. We will come and look into duality theorem in detail later on. I am not proving it, so I have not stated it clearly. Sir, so doesn't this question not make sense because you have Fourier transform in both directions and then you want us to calculate A, so we already don't know the constants anymore because we don't know if you have to calculate from the sink to the uh, rectangular function or from the rectangular function to the sink. So you get two different answers. No, no, but here we have XT, which is a time domain signal, right? And by convention, so all of this is by convention. So XT is a time domain signal. And this by convention is X omega, right? And so to understand the relationship between XT and X omega, I am using this equation, these two equations. If you use these two equations, these two equations are perfectly valid. Okay. Is it okay or what's your question? I I haven't understood it. Um. So so the question, I guess it's fine then. But like the question was basically because you have drawn Fourier transform in both directions, the arrow. So no, it just it, yeah, that. it just says so. This arrow just says that this X T has a Fourier transform X omega, and in this direction, this has to be actually inverse Fourier transform. Okay. But normally, by notation, this is just represented by this arrow. That means you can go back and forth. That is the meaning of this arrow. Fine? Yes, sir. OK, yeah. Now let us come back to this. Yeah, so th the thought experiment that I'm going to do is increase this capital T. What should happen? See, if you increase capital T, its area will remain intact. Area of the sink. Area of the sink is only a function of what is the 2 pi x0, right? x0 is fixed. So area of this sink function has to be preserved to 2 pi. So again, the area, that means I can draw a triangle here. This triangle has to be preserved to 2 pi. Area of the triangle has to be preserved to 2 pi. If you increase this capital T, what should happen? The height of this triangle increases. OK, but its area has to be preserved. That means what? That means what? As we increase capital T, this triangle instead of like this, it will become something like this. Because its height has to increase and area has to preserve. So it has to shrink in this direction. So this is what we are going to show as you increase capital T, sink becomes like this. As you increase this capital T again, the sink again becomes like this. And you have a triangle whose area always has to be preserved to two pi. So what happens when my T tends to infinity? If my t tends to infinity. Pi delta. Sorry. What should we get when my t tends to infinity? 2 pi delta. 2 pi delta omega, right? Again, this is an area preserving function. And its area is preserved to 2 pi. So my when my t tends to infinity, I should get 2 pi delta omega. What happens when my t tends to infinity? What happens to this function, rectangular function? It becomes a constant. OK. So if you have xt as 1, what is its Fourier transform? Its Fourier transform is 2 pi delta omega. This is the easiest way to prove this. And if you want to simply solve this equation, xt as 1, then you know that you are in deep trouble. You cannot solve this. But this thought experiment will help us solve this equation. What is the Fourier transform of xt being 1? The Fourier transform is 2 pi delta omega. 
Everyone understood this? Hello, excuse me, sir. Yes, Avinav. Sir, here won't we have a train of sim train of impulses? Like there will be impulses in uh, for different domains. Right? Why will we have impulse only for omega equal to zero? Like they all will converge to some point, right? What? What did I you mean, say? These these am amplitudes, smaller ones, which get which reduce along with omega uh -huh. as omega increases, won't they converge to a like for each omega to some no, value? If when my t tends to infinity, you will. Yeah, when my t tends to infinity, you would see. What happens is maybe I will draw here. When my t tends to infinity, you will have a lobe whose amplitude is very high, yeah, so high that we cannot tell how high it is. And where will be the first? Uh, where will be the null points? They will be at zero, right? Because this width. Okay, we'll shrink down to zero. Yeah. And then you will have something very trivially arising there, but this whole contribution is zero. Won't matter. Yeah. Thank you. Now, if you have understood the Fourier transform is one is two pi delta omega, we shouldn't stop there. We should use this more. And yeah, so this is okay. Fourier transform of one is two pi delta omega. Now, if you know this Fourier transform of one is two pi delta omega, let us see. Can we do something more with this? So Fourier transform of one is two pi delta omega. That means I have solved this integration. And you would have solved this for the first time in your life, right? By using any other tools, you wouldn't be daring even to solve this, right? So we now know what is this? This is 2 pi delta omega. Amazing. But let us not stop here and let us do something more. And the more is instead of omega, I choose omega minus omega naught. So I also need to have omega minus omega naught here. OK. And the moment I do this, I can pull out this omega naught. I can write it like this. So this tells me something more that the Fourier transform of e to the power j omega naught t. What is that? This is 2 pi del omega minus omega naught. Amazing, even solving this was hard. And I have what? What did I do? I killed the two words with one stone, something like that. So I have solved two integrations for a transform of one is two pi delta omega. Let me put equality for a transform of this is this. And for a transform of rect t by t. The frame that helped me to get all of this is t sync omega t by two. OK. Let us see if I can go ahead. What is the Fourier transform of? Signum T. Or sine T. OK, what is sine T? Sine T is a function. Just that tells us the sine of T. So if T is positive, it will give me one. If t is negative, it will give me minus one. So its name is good, sine t. OK, so sine t looks like this. If t is positive one, if t is negative, minus one. OK, sine t mathematically can be written as this, ut minus u of minus t. OK, so what is the Fourier transform of sine t? Can I leave this as an exercise? Possibly yes. 
look at the slides. I think it's quite easy and no uh, complicated steps are involved. But work this out. If you still have any doubt after going through this slide, just ask me. Let us see what is the Fourier transform of delta t. Fourier transform of delta t is easy. You can just use this to solve this. What is it? Or a transform of delta t will be one, right? One. Yes. Yeah. So now see the duality. Or a transform of one, where this is x t, is two pi del omega. But for a transform uh, of delta t is not simply one up one by two pi, which if you just use duality, it would be that, but Fourier transform of delta t is 1. So there are a few constants which are missing. OK, but the shape would remain intact. So this is correct. And yeah, this will be an event function. There is no phase in 1. And would it be a low pass filter? No. No, no low pass filter. Low pass filter is something which allows only low frequencies to pass through. So it filters out low frequencies. So if you have a signal like this, uh, so typically the low pass filter response is something like this. So this would be x omega or mod of x omega however you want to say it. so let me say mod of x omega so mod of x omega will be something like this so you can see it passes low frequencies more and high frequencies it kills so this is omega okay so typically like this you have a low pass filter okay high pass filter will be something like this so this is high pass filter Fine. You can also have a band pass filter, which will be something like this. Band pass filter. It passes the bands of frequencies. Low pass, high pass, band pass. And if you have X omega, mod of X omega like this, it's an all pass filter. It passes all frequencies. Okay. So we have basically four kinds of filters, low pass, high pass, band pass, all pass. There's one more, band stop, which is something like this, band stop filter. So basically you have to look at mod of x omega versus omega. And if mod of x omega versus omega is like this, so this is a band stop because it kills a band of frequencies. OK, so five kinds of filters, low pass, high pass, band pass, all pass, band stop. So here my X omega is constant, right? So it's not a low pass filter, it's an all pass filter. OK, so I think we will stop here and we will or possibly I can also do this just one minute it would not take more than one minute so if you have a periodic signal we said that the Fourier transforms are used for a periodic signal but now I am going to change that now let us say that my input signal is a periodic signal if it is a periodic signal it can always be expressed in terms of Fourier series right so xt could be expressed like this if I have to take the Fourier transform of this signal what would be this so a k is a constant, right? So I will have a k. So I'm just writing the Fourier transform. And what is the Fourier transform of this function? e to the power j k omega naught t. We already have seen this. This is 2 pi del omega minus k omega naught. Right, so done. So the Fourier transform of a periodic signal is this. Let me draw this. So the meaning of this is that now I have impulses. 
Now I have impulses. Where are these impulses present? These impulses are present at omega naught, two omega naught, three omega naught, and so on and so forth. Because it's a periodic signal with a certain period, right? So omega naught is two pi by t. So now I have impulses present at these discrete frequencies. And what is the area of these impulses? Area of these impulses is given by two pi a case. So if you know what is a are, the area of these impulses would be given by two pi a one, this two pi a two, and so on and so forth. So moral of the story is, if you have a periodic signal, a the spectrum will be built using impulses. Again, this is a discrete spectrum. It is not a continuous spectrum, but instead of lines, we have now impulses. And the area of these impulses is simply two pi areas of Fourier series coefficients. Sorry, area of these impulses is two pi times Fourier series coefficients. Okay, so suppose if you have a line spectrum, just as an example, something like this. For four a, uh, for periodic signals, you can calculate the line spectrum, right? Something like this. Now you can easily calculate this Fourier transform. Nothing changes. You just put the impulses in instead of the lines. And you just show that the area of these impulses is two pi, these coefficients, two pi 0.5. 2 pi 1 by 4 and so on and so forth. OK, so going from land spectrum to Fourier transform is easy for periodic signals. OK, so I stop here and uh, we will look at few other things in the next lecture. Any final question from your side? So tomorrow I'm uh, going to take an extra class 10 to 1130. For those who cannot attend this, we will again have the same class on Monday. Same thing. Any final question? OK, thank you so much for your time. See you tomorrow or on Monday. Bye, take care. Thanks, sir.